All right, so Vito and Tatum, you don't have to know their names, but they did an experiment. They were the ones that first tried to figure out sort of what the job of DNA was. Um, and they came up with a hypothesis based on what they discovered. So they studied a bread mold called Neurospora. And what makes bread mold a good thing to study, funguses in general, a good thing to study is that they're haploid. If you don't remember what that means, they only have one copy. So if, um, if they only have one chromosome for each gene, that would mean that there wouldn't be like heterozygous, um, whatever you, whatever code you carry, that's the gene you would show. So what they did was they would hit the bread mold with x-rays and then they would look to see what kind of mutations it got. And so for example, if the x-rays damage, let's say here, gene B, then whatever that code score, they wouldn't be able to do it anymore. Whereas if it was a diploid organism, even if you messed up gene B, you would have a second copy. So it made it really easy to study them since they only have one copy of each gene, any damage would be really easy to see. So they studied what we call a metabolic pathway, which I've talked about metabolic pathways before. They are a, in this case, it was a digestive pathway. In other words, if you fed the fungus a food source, and then um, it, in order for it to survive, it would digest that in a series of steps. So step one, it would break it into ornithine. Step two, would break ornithine into citrulline. And then the last one would break it into the amino acid arginine. The names are not important at all. All you really need to understand is that what happens in a metabolic pathway is that each step feeds into another step to make some kind of final product. And in this case, it was a digestion pathway. All right, so they took these neurospora, they hit them with x-rays. They knew that x-rays would damage the DNA. And then what they did was they would wait and see what kind of things the neurospora would now be able or not be able to do. So, um, we go to this slide, so this is a little confusing, but in essence, here's what they did. If they, for example, had a neurospora that had a mistake in this enzyme, enzyme A, then if you put it on the precursor, which is sort of like the, the food source, in essence, the, the fungus wouldn't survive. Because since it couldn't break the precursor into ornithine and go through this series of steps, it couldn't make this amino acid that it needed and it would die. Um, what they discovered was if they took all the funguses that couldn't make this enzyme, they always had a mistake in the same area of their DNA. In other words, they were able to make a link that every time there's a mistake in a particular area of the DNA that they call gene A, the fungus could not make that enzyme. If instead you feed the fungus the precursor, and enzyme A is working, so they can make ornithine, but then enzyme 2 isn't working, they would get to this point and they wouldn't be able to break it down any further. And every time they found one that had a mistake in enzyme 2, it always um, had an error in the same area of the chromosome that they called gene B. So they came up with what they called the one gene, one enzyme hypothesis. They basically said that what a gene really is is it's a code for making an enzyme. Every time the DNA gets messed up here, it's always enzyme A. Every time the DNA is messed up here, it's always enzyme B. And every time the DNA is messed up in this area, it was always enzyme C. So how would this translate to test questions? So based on the one gene, one enzyme hypothesis, this is what you might see on a test. So I give you a pathway. Um, and let's say that the organism digests, starts with A as its food source, and then it has these enzymes, and it breaks the food source down step by step by step into product. The first question I could ask you from a pathway like this, based on the one gene, one enzyme hypothesis, would be how many genes would there need to be to code for this pathway? How many enzymes are there? Three. So if one gene codes for one enzyme, how many genes? Three. So however many enzymes there are, that's how many genes there would need to be. So in this one, one gene to code for enzyme one, one to code for enzyme two, one to code for enzyme three. The next thing they would want you to understand is, let's say that they tell you that the gene for enzyme two is messed up. In other words, they can't make enzyme two right here. 
They could then ask you a multiple choice question like this. If the gene for enzyme 2 doesn't work, what would you see happen in the Petri dish? Would you see a buildup of A with no B, C, or D, a buildup of A, B, and D with no C, a buildup of product C, or a buildup of product B with no C or D? Which of those do you think matches what you would see happen if enzyme 2 was not working? Any guesses? I hear A. Well, enzyme, it, enzyme, this is enzyme 1. I, this might look like a 2. This oh. is enzyme. Sorry. 1, 2, 3. So it's this enzyme that's not working. So would you like to revise that answer? So D. So some people, and this is the mistake people make, some people will pick B. Because they'll see the problem here, and they'll just think that they can't make C, but it can make everything else. But this is a linear pathway. It's sort of like if you were running, and everybody started here, and you had to get around the L to the other side of the school. We'd all have to go through the same doorways. If one of those doorways was shut, we could get to everything before that door, but we'd all build up, and we couldn't get past that door. So the correct answer here is D, which is what a couple people said. B would build up. It would be able to get from A to B. You'd see a buildup of B, but then it couldn't get past that step, so you would see no C and no D. What if it was enzyme 3 instead? What would we see then? Right. It would be able to get to C, so we'd see a buildup of C. Everything would get to this point, but then it would hit a wall, and you'd see a bunch of C, and you'd see no product. And that's how they were able to pinpoint where the mistakes were. So they called it, like I said, the one gene, one enzyme hypothesis. The thing is, we've modified this, because today we know a couple of things that they didn't. First of all, we know that a DNA is the code for enzymes, but not just enzymes. In other words, they weren't wrong, but they weren't really, they were really too specific. They did not realize um, that genes coded not just for enzymes, but basically for every protein. So enzymes, hormones, pigments, ID markers, antibodies, transport proteins, all the proteins in every living thing are all coded for by genes, by DNA. Secondly, we now know today that some proteins, final proteins, like hemoglobin, for example, are made of multiple chains, like quaternary structure, if you remember quaternary structure. So in a case like that, you might need multiple genes to code for the final protein. In other words, a gene doesn't necessarily code for the final protein if it's a quaternary one. It codes for one polypeptide chain. That's what a gene is. It is a code for one polypeptide chain, which then may be a protein in itself or may be part of a larger quaternary structure protein. So that's what a gene really is. And that's our last experiment, by the way. So the, there were, I think, a total of four. Make sure you have an understanding, not necessarily by the person's name of who did it, that doesn't matter but an understanding of, of how the experiment works and what results you would expect in different situations. That's what's important. All right, so that's what we know today. So genes are the codes for making proteins, technically making polypeptide chains that have some function. Um, and that's what every hereditary characteristic, being tall, having red flowers, all of that is due to proteins that are being made or coded for by specific genes. So any questions so far? Okay. So the last part of what we're going to do today is to talk about how they do that. So genes are the codes for making proteins. How do they actually make the proteins? Well, the first thing you need to understand is DNA is in the nucleus, and proteins are not made in the nucleus. Proteins are made in the cytoplasm. So that is a problem because DNA cannot leave the nucleus. It is stuck there. So it's sort of like if I had a message I needed to send to Mr. Giacobbe, but I couldn't leave my room to take the piece of paper down to him. What I could do, though, is I could send one of you guys. If you guys had the ability to leave the room, I could send a messenger from my room to his room, and I would stay here. And that's basically what DNA does. DNA's messenger, though, is RNA. And I know everybody's heard of RNA. We've talked about it a little bit before. So it is a chain of nucleotides exactly like DNA, but there are a few differences, and there are important differences. The first one is that the sugar in RNA is ribose instead of deoxyribose. And that's where the name comes from. Deoxyribose comes from the name of the sugar in DNA. Ribose comes from the name of the sugar in RNA. The second difference is that RNA uses a different base. It still uses A, G, and C, but instead of T, RNA uses U, uracil. 
which is a different base. Why it uses that, I don't know. It just does. Um, it, maybe if you look online, you'll find some explanation of why RNA uses uracil. But usually in the books, they just tell you to, you know, RNA uses uracil, DNA uses thymine. They never really go into why one uses one and one uses the other, but you should know that. And finally, probably the most important thing, RNA is single-stranded, meaning it's, it's not a double helix. It only has one side, which makes it smaller so it can leave the nucleus. Whereas DNA is stuck in the nucleus, RNA can leave because it's only a single side. Technically, RNA doesn't copy an entire strand of DNA anyway. What RNA is going to do is it's only going to copy a little segment. Remember that a chromosome might have a thousand genes on it. So if a, if a particular gene is activated, RNA is just going to copy one little section, and then it's going to leave the nucleus, and then the protein is going to get built. So let's talk um, about types of RNA. You may remember that there are three kinds. This, by the way, is, you can see these look almost alike. You would never have to identify DNA versus RNA from a molecular drawing like this. DNA, technically the difference, DNA deoxyribose on carbon number two does not have an oxygen. Deoxy, it's missing an oxygen. Ribose has an oxygen here, has an OH. So that's actually where the name comes from, but you won't be tested on that. And this is uracil, which is in DNA has thymine, and you can see they look almost alike. Without really getting close, they look pretty much almost the same. I think there's one group sticking off on the thymine. So you wouldn't have to identify it from a picture. All right, three kinds of RNA, messenger RNA or mRNA. That's the one that's going to actually take the message from the DNA out of the nucleus to the ribosomes. The second kind of RNA is rRNA or ribosomal RNA, and that's what the ribosomes are actually made of. So that's where you get ribosomal is because it composes the ribosomes. And ribosomal RNA is actually made in the nucleolus. So you may remember that from back in, in the chapter about the cell, that ribosomal RNA or rRNA was actually made by the nucleolus inside the nucleus. And finally, tRNA or transfer RNA, and that's the one that actually brings the amino acids and is actually going to build the protein. So these are the workers that are necessary for protein synthesis. DNA is technically like the instructions. And then these three kinds of RNA are the actual workers that are going to do the building.